All right. So before I've got a lot of stuff to say, and I've got really got something I want to throw at you and get your thoughts on it. But before that, what are your thoughts since we last talked? So that's chapters like 42 to 44. Uh, something like that. Yeah, there's been a few, a few chapters since we last talked. I mean, I guess not a great deal happened. I mean, what, what, when we last talked, what was the last thing we said? Like, what was what was going on at that time? I guess uh, had number nine just turned up. I think it was just before number nine turned up. So have we, have we not talked about that happening then? Yes, because I I know we we haven't talked. I te I I texted you. We we texted each other yeah. about number number nine actually splitting and showing two bodies at once. That's right. But yeah. We, but we did not discuss that in in person. Okay, right. So the last one we must have spoke to each other about was just number nine's appearance at the end of that chapter, rather than what happened after. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what what kind of just for me? Obviously, what sticks out in my brain is the <laughs> confirmation that number nine is a cordyceps fungus type kaiju, and yeah, that he can sure. not, not only replicate himself but take over bodies. But what what was your woohoo moment from the from these past few chapters? Uh, <laughs> honestly, it was it was funnily funnily enough, it was mostly that because I remember I was reading. And um, when I saw number nine split himself into two, the first thing that came to my head was like, oh, Betty's going to be losing her mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember laughing out loud for like a good five minutes, reading the chapter, just thinking, oh, my God, Betty's going to lose it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that I was did. a really cool moment. <laughs> yeah, and it's much, I just... The depth of the research that went into that imagery was fascinating. Mm. It, it went even beyond what I, more than what I knew because for my video, I wanted to find a really good picture of a, of a, of a cordyceps fungus doing what it does. And in searching, I found a scientific article by a guy named Fredrickson. Well, Fredrickson et al. There's a lot of people on these who do the work on these research. And they actually had a GIF within the paper it was a digital paper and it showed basically they took a thousand they took a a muscle from an ant that had been wrapped around by the zombie fungus and they sliced it thinly like thousands of times oh. and then they built up a 3D image of what it looked like the fungal fibers growing around the ant muscle so this is this is an ant muscle with teeny little fungal fibers growing around it so it's all on a nearly molecular scale and it looked exactly like the kaiju number nine fibers growing out of the ant the the injuries on the ant body. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, the the way and I was just there's not that much information out there, so I I'm, I was probably looking at the same paper that Matsumoto was looking at when he designed the imagery. Yeah, so, that's a good chance. Yeah, it, that was really exciting. <laughs> And then, Honestly. of course, there was the big thing that made me think Grim is going to love this. It was when Hikari Shinomiya yeah. showed up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I was so excited for that. When Because uh, we've talked about it before. You know how much I love that, that family. The Shinomiyas are just like my obsession with them grows every week uh, or every chapter, rather. And um, yeah, when, when Hikari, oh, like the reveal was so good as well. Uh, you can hear how excited I am now just talking about it. But the reveal was so good and like. They, it's like I think the panel says the name before you see the 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 person behind the name. Um, so it's like you know, uh, second division captain uh, Hikari Shinomiya, and then it shows the the panel with her in fleshed out in her full suit of armor, uh, and then it's like you know Hikari Shinomiya wielding the the uh, the uh, weapons number four. And yeah, that that one page, that whole page of her just standing there, kind of like just looking to the side, I was like, hell yeah! <laughs> really and just that. kind of a one of the most minor parts of that—that that she was the second division captain—that mm -hmm. yeah. made me happy as a storyteller. Because have you ever heard the joke about the three pigs in the university? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, it's 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 actually a prank, but the story goes around the internet where. Some guy said he pulled the, the greatest senior prank. He got three pigs. 
he painted numbers on them, number one, number two, and number four, and he released them into the university science hall. <laughs> All right, and so yeah. the university spent days trying to find pig number three. <laughs> it's just that the human brain naturally trying to finish the pattern. And so we're first introduced to the to the third division. Yep. Then we're introduced to the first division. Yeah. And so my brain immediately went, well, what's the second division? Yeah. And given the context, I'd assume that the second division was kind of like the naval coast guard division. Right. Because yeah, the first like you... division's right there in Tokyo Bay. The third division is further inland. It yeah. made sense to me that there's a more of a naval yeah, yeah, no, division that makes good sense. force. Yeah. But then Matsumoto, you know, twists it on us and no, 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 that was Hikari Shinomi's division. So mm. I think I like even more the fact that, uh, look, so we don't know, um, or at least I don't think we know. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, or you may be able to, but uh, we don't know what position um, Isao Shinomi held before becoming the director, no. the uh, director no. and deputy. That's uh, director another general. thing. From that very first flashback, I had wondered about the suit and tie. Mm. You in in manga, you generally don't see the military commander in just a suit and tie. Mm -hmm. And so that that kind of just stuck out in my brain as well. That's an interesting choice, but I just kind of accept it as part of the unusual flavor of Kaiju number eight. Yeah. And then when you saw him again in the in the backstory. I don't know if that counts as a flashback, more more just backstory. Backstory, yeah. Uh, he's again, he's wearing that suit and tie, mm -hmm. and he's not. Uh, I don't know quite how to say this. There is a difference between the way that James Bond wears a tie, and the character <laughs> wears a suit and tie, and the and the way the characters that in the office wear a suit and tie. Okay. And yeah. the way that the Hick Farmer character who has to go into town for a business meeting wears a suit wears and tie. A tie. Yeah, of course. And the way that Iso was wearing that suit and tie was far more like the soldier or the Hick Farmer going in for business. Like, it wasn't natural to him to be wearing that, but he mm. was wearing it as a matter of business. Mm -hmm. Like, he has to wear it for whatever it is he's actually doing. Yeah. Yeah, rather than a choice. <laughs> yeah. And so it, that, that, that's that, interesting, actually. That's really interesting because, yeah, as I said, we we have no idea what position he held before becoming director general. So we don't even know that he was. I mean, assuming a natural progression of rank scale, yeah. he ha I think he 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 was almost certainly in the defense force at that point. Yeah, but we don't know that he was in, even in the defense force. Well, at that true. Time. Yeah, we don't know that. That's a good point. And, and we've seen that. Members of other branches of the Japanese military can transfer over, because that that's what Aoi did. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting. I can't wait to find out more. <laughs> as always. Okay, so the main reason that I want to talk to you, I I I, I really enjoyed uh, your your the discussions you had with Anime Ramble. Oh, cool! Thank you. <laughs> and one really got me thinking. So. Do you offhand know, like, this seems like a tangent, but it's not, I promise. Okay. Do you offhand know, like, the one major contribution to international murder law that came out of Great Britain? Fairly recently by Great Britain standards, like, Fairly within the past few hundred years. Oh, uh... But the, but the one maybe kind of defining concept of homicide law. No, I don't. No body, no murder. Oh, right, Okay. Yeah, because some, some guy disappeared, and another guy was tried and hung for his murder, and then, like, five years later, the guy shows up. He'd been shanghaied and has been the past oh. five years on a ship. Oh, damn, okay. So that, that was when Great Britain passed the law. Okay, if you can't, if you can't provide us with a body, we, we're not going to process anybody for murder, no matter right. what the situation is. Yeah, they won't classify and it as a murder with no body. That's kind of the, the real-life rule that the cinematic rule, no body, no death, is kind of based off of. Right. So I, I just thought that was cool. It's kind of a tangent, but I thought it was, <laughs> But I this to... relates somehow to what you're going to say. Do are we <laughs> sure that Hikari Shinomiya is actually dead? Oh. <laughs> and has oh. did that thought occur to you before I just tossed it at you right now? <laughs> it only has very briefly, and then I and that was to myself, and then I kind of dismissed it but i've never fully dismissed it <laughs> okay so where information comes from is very important in the story 
Mm-hmm. And the only and one on the one hand, we have the negative clue. Mm-hmm. All official reports and discussion of the number six incident are very, very sterile and vague. The cataclysms resulting from number six, not what number six did. I'm beginning to spec- suspect that number six might not have been your traditional Godzilla kaiju. There might have been something weird about it. Like they maybe it released it gases. Be, or... Yeah, they definitely paint it to be. Uh, you know, a completely unique force to be reckoned with yeah, from what they faced before. The all the death the death toll came from the cataclysms resulting from, mm-hmm. not directly. And but when they're talking about the more conventional kaiju, they like kaiju number two destroyed sub, the c- c- city of Sapporo. That's they, right. It's a very active voice, but it's a very mm-hmm. passive voice for kaiju number six. And they never there is never any official statement that she died from the official people talking because i believe me i went through and i checked the only place it says <laughs> she's you. dead it's very telling because it's when iso is talking to kikoru mm-hmm. and he says your late mother right now you in normally i would consider that a word of creator kind of a, the final say on the subject as far as he knows she's dead but the situation was a father talking to his seven-year-old daughter about something that happened. And given everything that's the weird passive voice they described the number six incident in and all the weird stuff around that, if something went horribly wrong, and I'll get into what I think may have gone horribly wrong later, (laughs) it would make perfect sense. uh, And if Hikaru Shinami isn't dead, if something worse happened to her, A, that's not something that's going to be declassified. B, that's not something you lay on a seven-year-old. Oh, no, of course. And so the thing that really got me thinking was in your conversation with Anime Ramble, he brought up Claymore. Yes. And I got into it, but right right as I started university, and so I lost track of it when university ate my soul. (laughs) Yeah, I've been there. Uh. The, the concept being that in Claymore, the ability to fight the monsters is granted by, you know, injecting some kind of blood that gradually turns the human thus injected into a monster, basically. And when they get too monsterified, they have to they have to basically be put down. Yeah, that's pretty much the that's the long and short of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we were then, of course, you were talking about how both my. You, Anime Ramble, and myself seem to have all spontaneously noticed that the way they talk about what happened to Hikari Shinamaya, it's just as likely that her suit killed her, or rather she pushed herself too hard Mm -hmm. and overheated fatally. Yeah, I definitely think that. (laughs) And then Anime Ramble suggested that, well, what... Give, it's given the evidence that there's all of... We saw all of the neural safeties. Basically, there are safeties that are protecting... uh, Iso Shinamiya from number two mm-hmm. that it's entirely possible that the these powerful numbered weapons that co- that do contain the aura of the Daikaiju they came from mm-hmm. have the potential to overwhelm their user. Yeah. So what if Hikaru Shinamiya pushed herself so hard but it didn't overheat and kill her? N- the number much four more weapon, ominous. because that is a full body weapon. Yeah got her uh, completely overwhelmed her and she basically went feral yeah and i'll be be honest with you from Uh like so when i had the the thought you know the the fleeting thought that she might not be dead that's the direction my mind went in as well like for me that's one of the only ways that it would be possible yeah so then there during the funeral scene Mm -hmm. It struck me as interesting the raw emotion that was radiated that was just radiating off of ISO during that scene. It seemed to me that there was too much anger in it for it to be strictly natural to the situation. I mean, after all, she was a soldier. Presumably, he was a soldier. They knew what they were getting into. If she had just died, even if she had worked, if even if she had died by essentially by her own hand, by pushing herself to death, 
the emotion he was expressing didn't seem quite in line with the situation. Uh, yeah, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. So it that that stay, the rage seemed t- um, especially the fact that he wasn't Specific. reaching out to Koru. Yeah. That's the kind of super intense emotion you get when you when you're feeling extremely guilty about something. In my experience. No, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. And so then, just kind of, the Matsumoto is really good at layering on artistic echoing. Mm-hmm. And our first real introduction to Iso as a full character, and not just the boogeyman of his daughter's <laughs> failures in her mind, is his oh, interaction. Is him deciding to personally go in and either prove Kafka innocent or put him down himself. And I think all of us commented on, whoa, we didn't expect the director general to go in and do it that himself. Oh, yeah. So what if that was a remnant of his guilt over either, because I can see this going two ways, and, and I can't, I don't have any real opinion on which of the two ways it might have gone. It came to the point where Hikari went rogue and needed to be taken down. Either he couldn't or he did. Because if she's dead, I kind of see Iso had to take her down himself because... With the number two weapon, he he was probably the only one who had the power to do it. He would definitely have been probably only one of, of a group of two or three who would who would have had the power to take her down. Yeah, I can see that. 100%. And if he, if he did it, that might have explained his rage and his guilt. But also, if he wasn't able to do it, if people died, if she if she if she died or was put, you know put into lockdown with innocent blood on her hands because he allowed sentiment to interfere with his, with what he knew was his duty. Mm-hmm. I think that would probably explain that super intense emotion and in him locking himself off from his daughter in sentiment. Or yeah, trying. absolutely. I can see that. I can definitely see that. Okay. So that's the first, so that's my thought. Do you, do you have <laughs> any thoughts on what may or may not have happened to Hikari Shinomiya? Uh, honestly, I, I know you, I, I know, was this what you told me to not watch your video about? Yeah, that, that was the <laughs> yeah. first one. So, um, yeah, that is really good that you told me not to, because um, that means that what I'm about to say is is uh, genuine. But, um, yeah, I uh, I can't, if I was going to just come up with you know, my reasons for why she might not have died, this is the exact path I would have gone down. I um, with, with you just laying it out like that, my mind is just kind of like clicking with it and, and um yeah, that's exactly what I would have come up with too. So I think you pointing out about um, Isao's emotions at the um, funeral is very good as well because um, I hadn't really thought about it. At first, I was kind of just going to dismiss that as the fact that, you know, some some people go through um, their grief differently and it could just be that he was choosing to latch on to the, the anger part of it rather than anything else. But I can definitely see with you explaining it like that how... Um, you know the the guilt of the situation or you know depending on what it what it would have been could have influenced that kind of emotion coming out of him instead and i could definitely see that especially um i especially i think out of the two i especially like the idea that he may have had to put her down himself um so if we do go more down the route that she is dead i i definitely i think i like the idea that he had to deal with her more than the fact that she might be alive if that makes sense yeah Okay, now, that was the first prong of the idea that your conversation with Anime Ramble gave me. <laughs> the second prong goes back to a th- uh, one of my theories that has not been confirmed nor- or denied yet. Remember I I mentioned that, uh, I think it was Blue Green Phoenix and I were talking over on Reddit. Mm-hmm. And Blue Green Phoenix, I, I was listing why I thought number nine would be a more continuous villain than a one-off. Oh, yeah. Because of all of the weird um, mirrors that number nine has with number eight, both visually yeah. and character-wise. And Blue Green Phoenix brought up that also, as kaiju number eight, Kafka seems to have the ability to s- suppress kaiju in the same way that number nine has, in the, in the opposite way that number nine has of reviving him. And there's three main pieces of evidence. The first one is when he rescues Kikoru the first time. He There's this really funny scene that's played for laughs that goes, 
he goes, let's see you regenerate from that. And they actually start to regenerate. And then he says, stop it, stop it. I didn't mean it. And they stop regenerating. And at the time, I thought it was just a play on playing off of his naturally humorous, humorous character and, and an accidental timing. But then, and then when he punches the bomb, there, at the time, I didn't think too much about it because it was rule of cool. And I was, I more than happily <laughs> to ignore cool. plenty of, plenty of inaccuracies for the rule of cool in a manga like this. That's but he exists. punches the bomb and it doesn't go off for several seconds later. And the manga makes a point of that. It spin, it, it doesn't spend time. It spins panels, yeah, showing you that there is a time delay between when he punched it and when it detonated, which is what allowed it to go higher up in the air, and what appears to have saved the base. Which makes no sense because if you just punch a bomb, uh, there's not a single type of bomb I know of that if you punch it really hard right before it's about to go off. You have a delayed it, reaction. <laughs> yeah, it might stop it from going off entirely if it like uh, yeah, disconnects. Yeah. That would be more believable things, than the But delayed, it doesn't uh... delay it. Yeah. And so if he, and, at, and right, right before there was the charge up scene where he was exuding all of that kaiju energy and then he punches it. And there, there was a third instance. Oh yeah, when, the, but the main one was when he was fighting kaiju number nine to rescue Reno. Kaiju number nine flat out states... I can't regenerate. Something's something's wrong. It's abnormal. That's right, yeah. And again, there was a lot of emphasis put on that. So that kind of led us to suspect that Kaiju number eight has the ability to suppress um, the growth of Kaiju tissue. Interesting. Okay, and then you, the main emotional arc of, of <laughs> Kako, the thing that's kind of fascinated with us, her, with her character, because she was she was such a peculiar manga character from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Comes off as a sundre, but is from the beginning 100% main character levels of loyalty to her companions. Then we discover that's yeah. because of her mother and her guilt over not being able to save her mother. Mm -hmm. So we have that. Just keep that thread in mind for a second. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. Now, one thing that I've I've done several comparisons so this probably just exists in my own mind but the writing style of Matsumoto sh shows a lot of similarities to Tolkien's writing style to me the emphasis on relationship and wholesomeness and how there's good in the world and it's worth fighting for yeah and one of the main themes of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was it was it was not the giant combat scenes that saved the world, it was the small act of kindnesses, kindnesses and compassion and goodness, as exemplified by Bilbo and Frodo both sparing Gollum when they could have easily killed him in what mm -hmm. might even be semi-justified situations. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what allowed the ring to be destroyed. Okay, now take those two ideas and follow me as I put them together. I'm with you, I'm with you. Kikoru believes that she was unable to save her mother. Mm-hmm. And I, I ha he hasn't actually absolutely stated this, but I have no, I have no, there's no doubt in my mind that he, I so also believes this, that he failed to save his wife. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. Now, there are no two characters who have had more to do with keeping Kafka alive than those two. <laughs> yes, agreed. So Kafka, who instinctively takes care of people and has the ability to suppress kaiju energy. Now, there's one more thread I want to throw in before I bring it all together. <laughs> okay. So, Kafka battled kai the Daikaiju, Kaiju number nine, and, th and then was involved in the battle with the Daikaiju number 10. Mm -hmm. And then when faced with the aura of Daikaiju number two, he had to suppress Kaiju number eight's power because the actual Kaiju took over, went crazy. The little guy took over, went crazy, trying to fight. Would it proceed to be Kaiju number two? Mm-hmm. So if the story's following up on the sapience of the little guy at all, it's going to have to involve an arc where where the little guy learns to differentiate between actual daikaiju and a human wielding a daikaiju weapon. Mm -hmm. So what if, and this is just pure pipe dream crackpot theory now. Yeah, that's what all the what fun's about. What if we're heading towards an arc where Kafka as kaiju number eight is going to encounter Hikari as the feral kaiju number four. 
Kafka goes to Ooh. fight her, but the little guy recognizes that instead of being a true Daikaiju, this is a human in a Daikaiju suit. And then uses that kaiju suppression power to rescue Hikari from the feral daikaiju state. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> okay. That would be crazy. <laughs> that would be... Wow. Yeah, that would be pretty hype. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that would be pretty hype. I Because he would be like the only... Like if we if we take everything that you've said as gospel, uh, yeah. Up to if, that you, point, if you if you take, I counted out. There's like five unproved theories involved. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but like that's what theories of that's why theories are fun. Like that's we're just we're just talking, we're just chilling. Um, but yeah, if we take everything that you said up to that point for gospel, then we can assume at that point that Kafka's the only one w that would have the power capable to even do this. Whereas it's the kind of power that the defense force would have never have seen, heard of, even thought possible. So, yeah, that, it's really cool to think that if that was the case, you know, Kafka and suddenly the, comes along and then suddenly, you know, he's able to do that. That would, that would change a lot for a lot of people. Yeah. And the only reason that he's able to do that is that Kikoru stood up for him and Iso fought for him. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like, it's almost like paying them back in some way. Or, yeah, and it's almost like... Kikoru retroactively actually managing to save her mother. Oh yeah, I can see that. She saved Kafka, and now Kafka saves her mother. Yep. Yeah, dude, that's dope. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that. I... That was a cool theory. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun mulling it over because it, you know, how these things they, they just kind of come to you. Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> theories usually do. And then you have to spend time kind of thinking, yeah, but would that work? Bop, bop, yeah. bop. And then, you, and then when you land on something you think would work, that's, that's what makes it so much fun. Yeah. I love theories. They, they are a lot of fun. <laughs> so speaking of, where do you think that, that, if that story plays out, of course, that's going to be some distance in the future. But oh, yeah, that won't be anytime soon. Where do you think the next soon. chapter is going? Uh, next chapter, right. <laughs> Okay. So Kikoru, Kikoru's just been uh, tearing apart Kaiju number nine. Her her theory is that Kaiju number nine is suppressing Kafka. uh, Kafka's transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, so we've just obviously we've just completed part of the backstory, and that's what led us into uh, understanding Kikoru a lot more. Um, so that chapter was was pretty much just all about you know them and and what caused them to become where they are at, at this point. Um, so next chapter, I imagine we're obviously we're going to kick things straight back off with Kikoru most likely because she was in the middle of a swing. <laughs> um, but I think as hard as she because we have to remember as well she's injured um she th she did take a hit it's not like she's yeah. not taking hits so in terms of how likely it is that she can pull out a w here i'm not sure um i think it's more likely that she'll you know she'll try her hardest and she'll probably get pretty close or she'll at least push nine to towards his upper limits but i still think it will get to a point where somebody stronger is going to have to jump in and um, it will once again humble Kikoru, even though even though she doesn't act like well, I don't think she seriously acts like a big head. I think no. she, you know, at the beginning when she was introduced, she gave this impression that she was a big shot and she was better than everyone else. But I don't think she truly feels that as much as she acts that, because as we've seen, she clearly doesn't think she's anywhere near strong enough and everything that she's working towards is in the pursuit of becoming stronger so that she can protect those that uh, that you know she can protect those on the battlefield um so yeah i think i think someone stronger still has to come along to kind of it will be a it will be a point where for, for kikoru she's she's accomplished so much but she's still got much further to go and that will just open the room for more development in her case because we know that she's going to get much more powerful um, you know, the story is painting her to be someone that will reach that like, captain level for sure, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I think next, I don't know if it's going to be next chapter or the chapter after, because obviously um, the way they're going to pace the battle is up for anyone's guess. But I think 
it's more likely that someone stronger will come along. So probably it's most likely going to be in the case of Narumi at the moment because he's he's there, even though he's dealing with his own number nine. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that's going to be as much of a challenge for him. I think it's more of just a deterrent for as long as possible. But uh, yeah, we shall see. <laughs> that's my thoughts on that at the moment. So Humans are weird. We took a vote. The second book of human absurdity is now up and going on Indiegogo. If you follow the links below the video, you will be able to pre-order your copy of Humans Are Weird. We took a vote in electronic format or paperback format. Now, as last, same as last time, everybody who orders the paperback format will automatically get the author read version of the Humans Are Weird audiobook. And in addition, this time, I am going to announce one of my first stretch goals. If I sell 500 books, then I am going to take the money and I am going to hire the local studio to make a full-on audiobook. High quality, professional recording, professional scripting, everything. So that's going to be my first announced stretch goal. At 500 books, I am going to hire Willamina Studios to make a full-on audiobook. Everybody who orders a paperback book will get the audiobook as a matter of course if we reach that first stretch goal. All right. Humans are weird. We took a vote. The second book of human absurdity available on Indiegogo. Check out the links below.